Hello everyone, and welcome to a new Adams and Sporks Journal Club. And in this video, I want to talk about this paper by Andreas Schilling et al. from the University of Zurich, which just appeared in the journal Science Advances. And it is a very, very cool little paper, and I really like it, and I thought I'd share it. To see what the paper is about, think of a hot body, say something like a hot cup of tea, that is introduced to a large room at room temperature, and as a result, starts to cool down. So we have our body, which is initially at some high temperature, we'll call that TB, and we have the room, which is at a certain lower temperature, we'll call that TR. And basically, these two systems, the T and the room, will trade heat with one another, such that there is a net, or overall heat flow, from the hot T to the cold room. And because of this, the T gets colder, and the room gets hotter, and the two systems finally establish a thermodynamic equilibrium at some temperature in the middle. So this is the normal way of things, this is what we expect to happen. However, what was done in this paper was basically to create a situation where the hot tea can be brought into contact with the colder room, and yet the tea walks away being colder than the room. In essence, like they say in the title of the paper, they create a net flow of heat from the cold object to the hot one in violation of expectation. Now, I want to be clear here, as we'll see, this system doesn't actually violate any laws of thermodynamics, but rather it uses those laws to gain the system to create a scenario where thermodynamics progresses in a way opposite to experience. It demonstrates that when we lazily say something like, heat always flows from hot to cold, we do have to be a little careful about paying attention to some of the fine prints of the laws of thermodynamics. So what did they actually do? Well, at the heart of it, what they do is to exploit the specific way in which a system like this achieves equilibrium in time. In other words, they're exploiting the dynamics of how the system gets from its initial non-equilibrium state to its final equilibrium state. And the type of dynamics they exploit actually relates to some very basic physics that will be covered in any introductory physics class, that of a so-called damped harmonic oscillator. Now, before we go talking about the oscillations of heat and temperature, it's probably helpful to talk about a more common situation where we see such damped oscillations, that of a spring system. In a system like this, the block has a natural position it wants to be in. It's the point where the, the two springs are pulling on it with equal strength, so right in the center here. We call that the equilibrium state of the system. But I can take this block and pull it out of equilibrium like this. If I do this and let it go, what happens? Well, if this was some sort of impossibly perfect system with absolutely zero friction and no heat generated in the springs, it's actually possible for it to oscillate back and forth forever about this point. But really, in any real situation, there will be things like friction, and as a result, we say the oscillator is damped. And a damped oscillator will eventually return to its equilibrium position. However, what is very important to us and this paper is how it returns to equilibrium specifically. Depending on the system, there are actually two different ways this can happen. The first is when the system is so-called overdamped. In this case, the system returns to equilibrium just like this. It's very abrupt and decisive. It just gets pulled right back to equilibrium. This case isn't so interesting for us. Rather, what we're interested in is the other case, where the system is so-called underdamped. And what is special about an underdamped system is that the relevant quantity, in this case the displacement of the block, is initially above the equilibrium value, and eventually it returns to that value. However, in getting there, it actually oscillates both above and below the value as it gets there. In the process of returning to equilibrium, there are times where it takes values less than equilibrium. Intuitively, what is happening here is that the system has a sort of inertia. In other words, the resistance it has to changes in its motion, and this is stronger than the damping tendency bringing it towards equilibrium. The damping eventually wins out, but in the short term, because the system has so much inertia, it overshoots the mark back and forth about its final goal. 
And in a very general sense, this is how the neat bit of physics in the paper is accomplished. In the initial state of the system, you have a hot body with a temperature Tb, and a cold reservoir with temperature Tr, and the entire body plus reservoir system is initially out of equilibrium at the moment you bring them into contact. However, by cleverly setting up the system, they fix things so that the way in which the system dynamically tends towards its final equilibrium temperature is like that of an underdamped oscillator. And as such an oscillator progresses to equilibrium in real time, there are times when the system oscillates into the regime where the body is actually colder than the reservoir. And then pretty simply, if you could time it right, you could actually just disconnect the connection between the two when you're at one of those points. If you did that, then the body would actually come away colder than the reservoir, in defiance of expectation. Furthermore, as we'll see, as the system temporarily passes into this regime where the body is the colder object, there will also be a period of time where the room is still pulling heat from it, because it hasn't quite gotten with the program yet, and as a result, you do get a window of time where flow is progressing from cold to hot. And at a conceptual level, at least, that's really all they did. Let's actually just look at two plots from the paper. The first one on the left is a theoretical plot of what the expected behavior should be that they engineered in their system. The different curves, by the way, basically just relate to what they expect depending on how performance or efficient they're able to make their system. But basically, the, the more blue the curve corresponds to having more and more high quality and efficient components in their setup. But the key point here is the y-axis, which shows the difference between the temperature of the body and the reservoir. So when the y values are negative, that means that the body is actually colder than the reservoir at that point. Here's the second plot, and this is the experimental data from their setup. So they actually made the system, and here are their results. And you see, just like the theoretical expectations, that they do indeed achieve a regime where the temperature of the body has overshot the reservoir temperature. And during this period, you temporarily have a case where net heat is flowing from the cold reservoir to the hot body. And this is, again, because they've engineered a sort of inertia to the heat flow so that it temporarily overshoots. Here's another plot from the paper, which is a theoretical calculation like before, except rather than considering a reservoir that is very, very large, it considers the case where the so-called reservoir is actually of equal size to the body. In this case, where both systems are the same size, we can see how their temperature progresses in time here. Looking at this, we can see that although eventually they meet up at a temperature exactly in the middle between their starting temperatures, and it's in the middle because they're identical objects, in the short term, in terms of the dynamics of how they get there, they actually switch off back and forth as to who is really the hotter object, to make doubly sure that no laws of thermodynamics have been harmed in this system, they also explicitly calculated the total entropy of this system, for both bodies combined, as a function of time, which you can see here. The second law of thermodynamics says that entropy must always increase in a thermodynamic system. That is indeed happening here as they trade back and forth, even though there are times when the initially hotter object is actually then the colder one. So that is the overarching idea, but how did they do it specifically? Well, let's talk about something different and talk about electricity and electrical currents. And there, there is a very common type of electric circuit called a resistor-inductor capacitor circuit, or RLC circuit for short. And no, don't ask me why inductors are often abbreviated with the letter L. And the electrical current in such RLC circuits behaves like a, well, a damped oscillator with the relative strengths of the resistance, inductance, and capacitance, tuning whether it behaves like it is under or over damped. But again, that's an example of an electrical system. What we are talking about here is heat currents and flows. But there is actually a way to connect the two, and that's through using something called a thermoelectric material. Thermoelectric materials are materials that have the property that if you apply a temperature difference across them, then an electrical voltage naturally forms across them in response. So they develop a voltage in the presence of a temperature difference. In other words, if you apply heat to one side of them, they can power an electrical circuit like a battery. 
Now, technologically, we use thermoelectric devices to extract power from heat, like in some types of generators used to power satellites, and they can actually be worked in reverse to turn electrical currents into a temperature difference. In other words, they can operate like refrigerators. However, in terms of efficiency, they're much less efficient than a conventional steam engine at turning heat into power, and much less efficient than a conventional refrigeration pump at turning power into localized cooling. Which is why they haven't taken the world by storm yet, but in this work, their main role is just to couple the flow of heat to the flow of electricity in a circuit they've designed. In fact, what they did here is they took a system composed of a very good electrical inductor and put it in a circuit with a thermoelectric device to make a combined heat plus electricity system that electrically behaves just like one of these RLC circuits. And that's basically how they did it. They literally have an electrical RLC circuit where the R and C part and kind of the battery part are coming from how the thermoelectric device is driving current. And the source of this current is coming from the heat itself. The heat is driving the circuit, and the circuit is then manipulating and controlling the heat flow. And the whole thing behaves like an underdamped oscillator in terms of the heat flow. And because it's an underdamped oscillator, it is possible to find the system in states of overshoot, where the hot cold labels have flipped. So that's what they did. That's the paper. I thought it was very cool and did some very interesting and unintuitive things based on what is ultimately some fairly basic physics. I hope you enjoyed it too. See you next time. Have a good one.